fireless locomotives. What the heck is a fireless locomotive? Where's the fire? Where's the rest of you? How could you run a proper steam locomotive without the cleansing fire? Well, uh, th there are some benefits to not having the fire on board a locomotive. Uh, mostly that there's no smoke. Uh, and, and smoke tends to tends to be hard to breathe. Uh, it's actually very bad to breathe. Don't 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 do that. And you might be thinking, wouldn't fireless locomotive also encompass something like an electric? And yes, technically, but that's not what the term usually refers to. In this case, a fireless locomotive is a type of locomotive that uses a reciprocating engine, like a classic steam locomotive, except it uses a reservoir of compressed air or steam. One of the two doesn't produce the air or steam on board and as such doesn't produce smoke. The result is an engine that can go into places where it's generally unhealthy for regular steam locomotives to go, such as in inner cities or in mines or inside of industrial buildings. There are plenty of places where a regular steam locomotive probably shouldn't be uh, on the basis of people needing to breathe. So fireless locomotives are used for those applications if it's possible, but they do have some disadvantages. While they are cheaper to make, a lot cleaner, as I've mentioned, and don't have nearly as high of a risk of fire, because there is none, or a boiler explosion for that matter, since they're already pre-pressurized and you can't make the pressure higher than it already is, in operation anyway, they do require a source to actually refill the compressed air or steam. They can't do that on their own, so they need some kind of air compressor nearby, or something that generates steam, depending on the exact model we're talking about. And they can't go very far because they have limited range. They, they only last as long as the pressure does. Once the pressure in the reservoir is gone, well, they're dead. They can't go any further. So, naturally, these are not mainline locomotives basically ever. There are very rare occasions where one of these would be used on a main line for any real reason, simply because they can't go far at all. They can only be used in industrial situations, constructing new lines, or shunting. Basically, any situation that doesn't require them to go anywhere, just move stuff around in one location. But in that context, they are pretty good, especially if they have to go inside of buildings or a mine, because people work in there and they're not producing any exhaust that's unsafe to breathe. Therefore, they have a rich history all on their own, because in their niche, they are quite useful. The earliest example of a fireless locomotive was probably Fowler's Ghost. It was a very early attempt at this. A locomotive designed by John Fowler, built in 1861, meant to be used on the Metropolitan Railway. Fowler's Ghost was not like typical fireless locomotives. She was weird and very, very bad. <laughs> uh, uh, not, not a good locomotive. Uh, she was a 240, and technically speaking, she's not purely a fireless locomotive. She would be a hybrid, having a firebox on board but capable of running without the firebox via a combustion chamber that contained what are called fire bricks. These are blocks of ceramic material that retain a tremendous amount of heat, acting as a heat reservoir and therefore keeping the locomotive steamed up even after the fire was doused. Fowler's thought was that she could be used in things like tunnels, and yeah, that was a great idea, except the fire bricks were a really bad frickin' idea. Not because they didn't work, they did, but in a normal steam locomotive, producing steam on board with heat, in a serious situation of malfunction, it is possible to drop the fire out of the engine. This is generally done whenever something jams or something else breaks, and basically they have to get the steam pressure down. Fowler's Ghost couldn't actually do that. In October of 1861, the condensing system on her leaked, causing the boiler to run dry and the steam pressure to drop. Without water in there, the metal started overheating and there was a very serious risk of explosion. But they couldn't actually stop the heat. They could only wait for things to cool off. She didn't blow up, but she very easily could have. A second trial did take place, but in this instance, uh, it didn't go well either. That's because she was actually a really poor steamer at least in the configuration she was in. It would later be sold off, and there was an attempt to modify it to a conventional engine, but that never happened. She sat around for years, and eventually was scrapped in 1895. She's only called Fowler's Ghost, not because that was her official name, but because Fowler, who had a rich history of success, 
as an English civil engineer, considered this engine his worst failure, and it probably was, to be honest. He didn't talk about it, ever. Pretended it never happened, and that's fair. So the first iteration of a fireless locomotive didn't go so well, but that didn't mean the principle wasn't good, it's just the technology wasn't developed. Instead of the whole fire brick concept, that was kind of thrown out the window, more modern fireless locomotives didn't even attempt to hybridize anything. They only carried the reservoir, and steam or air would be produced somewhere else. An earlier application of this idea was conducted by Emile Lamb, a French-born American inventor and a dentist. Yeah, he was a dentist. I don't... <laughs> One of those things. Anyway, he would create a couple different iterations of fireless locomotives. One utilized ammonia. That one, that one didn't really progress much further beyond that. That was not, not considered a very good idea in, in the grand scheme of things. But the other used stored steam and saw brief success, both in the United States and France, due to the fact that they could operate in inner cities as trams without producing the extra smoke and, you know, making the air somewhat unbearable in cities. We would actually wait a few more decades before clogging our cities up with smog. The cars decided to do that, and apparently people just stopped caring about it at some point. But back then, they actually did care. Go figure. But the range issue always held back fireless locomotives being used as trams. Eventually, they just started using electric trams, or trolleys. And those served faithfully for many decades until they replaced them with buses and then the buses started polluting the air. You see, you see how we've gone backwards here. Uh, anyway, but the fireless concept didn't just stop there. Other iterations were built, some quite large, and those are the ones that were used for industrial as well as shunting applications. Germany, in particular, loved fireless locomotives for shunting. They used quite a number of them. And they remained in service into the 1960s since they were so cheap. They didn't have as extensive maintenance protocols as a typical engine would. Because they only had to deal with the reservoir. As long as everything stayed in place, you didn't have to worry about much. There was some upkeep, of course, but not as much as normally would be. You have to remember, the smoke from the fire in a steam engine is harsh on the engine, too. But that kind of wear and tear just flat out didn't happen on a fireless locomotive. Especially if they were using compressed air, because it's just air. Over here in America, we started making quite large ones, because of course we did that. What were you expecting? Such as Pennsylvania Power and Light D, a 080. Though Germany had one that was a 010. They generally didn't get any bigger than that, but there were a handful of articulated ones, too. German company Hohenzollern built some articulated fireless steam locomotives with a cab at each end but only one of their bogies was actually powered. In specific applications, they were highly useful. The steam ones generally offered better range because they worked like conventional steam engines using the high pressure steam above the water in the accumulator. But as the steam is used and the pressure drops, the superheated water boilers replacing the used steam. So they can go a bit further than compressed air locomotives. Compressed air ones can't go as far but are much easier to manage because you don't need to actually heat anything. You just put in compressed air. So as long as you have an air compressor nearby, you could use a compressed air locomotive. And there were other hybrids beyond Fowler's Ghost. There was at least one attempt by the Sentinel Wagon Works to make a few called receiver locomotives, but they weren't successful either. It seems like hybridizing the concept was too complicated or made things too difficult, and it was really just one or the other. You couldn't do both. And the interesting thing about these fireless locomotives is that they've actually outlasted regular conventional steam locomotives in terms of working in industry. Despite the fact that diesels and electrics have replaced steam in the vast majority of places, fireless steam uh, is a bit of a different case. See, there's still plenty of power plants, for example, that use steam power to make electricity. Steam turbines, for example, are still used now. We went over that last time. But in those cases, you usually wind up with excess steam. The steam would normally just be vented that you aren't using. But if you're making it anyway, and you need a locomotive to move stuff around, why not just put the steam in that locomotive? As a result, you can still find some fireless steam locomotives in places like thermal power stations, or incineration plants, simply because they already have the steam right there, and it's super cheap to just put the steam into the engine. 
They're already making it anyway. Why not? You don't have to pay for fuel for a diesel or something. They're safe to operate and safe to be around, even inside buildings. So they're perfect, meaning that they are still used. Even here in the United States, Germany still uses them definitely. Without question, like I said, they love them. Indonesia still uses a handful, and Switzerland still uses some. There are quite a number in preservation, some of the larger ones as well, and they get kind of weird sometimes. They don't always look like an engine that you can use and move around, but they are. It's just sometimes the very simple ones are more like air tanks on wheels, which is basically exactly all they need to be, to be fair. Because remember, one of the other benefits is that they're very cheap. You can put a compressed air engine together at very little cost, and because of that, they're still around being utilized even now in their specific niche, their little corner of the industry. They've never been as famous as the larger, more powerful engines that produce their own energy, but they've always been incredibly useful little things. And a lot of people ask me to talk about them. And now I've talked about them. You're welcome. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fun farewell.